Who is Jesus? Well, the Gospel of Matthew, like the other Gospels, focuses on this central question, the question of identity. It's important for us to know who Jesus is so that we can know who we are. Matthew tells us, the readers, right away who Jesus is. Chapter 1, verse 1 says, an account of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. But for the characters in the story, the answer isn't as simple and straightforward as we might wish. It's more of a gradual revelation. For example, the, the Magi, the so-called three kings, seem to know that this baby boy that they're visiting is to be the king of the Jews. But I'm not sure they know exactly what that means. When Jesus later is baptized by John the Baptist, a voice from heaven declares, This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. When Jesus casts out the demons who had possessed two men, the demons immediately recognize him. What have you to do with us, Son of God? When Jesus later takes Peter, James, and John up a mountain and is transfigured, his face shining like the sun, his clothes dazzling white, a voice from the, cl the cloud again declares, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And when Jesus dies on the cross, Matthew tells us that the centurion and those with him said, Truly, this man was God's Son. And so this question of who Jesus is runs all through the Gospel of Matthew and the other Gospels as well. Now, our Gospel reading for today, um, we have this turning point in the story that Matthew is telling us. Jesus and the disciples are at Caesarea Philippi, it's up in the north of Galilee. It's a city dominated by reminders of imperial Rome and Roman ideas of what it means to be human. In that city of foreign domination, Jesus turns to the disciples and he asks them, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? Now, he's using one of the names for himself, the Son of Man, or the Human One, or maybe the Son of the Human. The disciples had heard lots of talk going around, and they said that some people thought he was John the Baptist, who had come back from the dead. Others thought he was a prophet from of old, maybe Elijah or Jeremiah or, or some other prophet who had suddenly reappeared in their midst. The people understood Jesus to be part of this great prophetic tradition, which was true enough in a way. Uh, then Jesus turns to the disciples again and asks the question of depth the question about personal orientation. But who do you say that I am? The disciples fell silent. But then Peter, of course Peter, spoke up. You are the long-awaited Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. As we find out in the next portion of Matthew, 
Peter's understanding of his own words is faulty. He thinks Jesus is the kind of Messiah who is going to chase the Romans out of their country and give it back to them. Jesus is going to solve all their problems and meet all their needs. Peter starts off saying the right words, but it turns out that he is off by about a hundred miles. He understands who Jesus is through his own limited perspective, his own narrow preconceptions. It has ever been thus. So how do we answer this question? Who do you say that I am? We know that Jesus represents many different things to many different people in their own time, in their own cultural experience. At various times in American history, for example, Jesus has taken on a range of identities. History professor Richard Reitman Fox, who teaches at the University of Southern California, has a book called Jesus in America, Personal Savior, Cultural Hero, National Obsession. Professor Fox looks at American history and culture, our art, music, literature, and drama, to examine the range of identities attributed to Jesus, the range of causes that are identified with Jesus. Jesus becomes a kind of mirror, reflecting the values and concerns and preoccupations of our own particular times and places. A good example is Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson had great respect for the eloquent and compassionate teachings of Jesus, but he believed that those teachings had been mutilated by the original gospel writers and by centuries of church dogma. So he took up his scissors and cut out everything in the New Testament that referred to the supernatural, the apocalyptic, the eschatological, you know, the stuff that makes us uncomfortable. By eliminating about 90% of the gospel narrative, Jefferson was able to present a Jesus who reflected the rationalist approach of the Enlightenment age. Of course, Jefferson's views were in the minority. Traditional Protestants and Catholics had a very different understanding. But what Jefferson did is at least emblematic of a new possibility in the American context. He demonstrated that it was possible to see Jesus from different perspectives, to see Jesus as a sanction of our own particular convictions and concerns. And so before the Civil War, for example, slave owners believed that Jesus was on their side. And those who wanted to abolish slavery were convinced that Jesus was on their side. Woody Guthrie, who wrote a lot of songs of social protest, had a song called Jesus Christ for President. A few decades later, George W. Bush said that he thought Jesus was the greatest philosopher that ever lived. I suspect that Woody and George probably didn't have exactly the same things in mind. For some, Jesus is a gentle friend, a personal savior, a mystical comforter, or a fierce judge. Some see him as a pacifist, 
while others view him as a warrior. There is a black Jesus. There is an Asian Jesus. And there is a white Jesus. There's an establishment Jesus. And there is a liberator Jesus. A popular slogan asks, what would Jesus do? WWJD. And a few years ago, uh, a group of evangelical Christians, moved by social concerns, published an advertisement saying, What would Jesus drive? WWJD. They said car pollution causes illness and death and most afflicts the elderly, the poor, the sick, and the young. Transportation is now a moral choice and an issue for Christian reflection. So what would Jesus drive? Professor Fox says, American children of all backgrounds position themselves in the world by finding out who they are in relation to Christ, the single most important American cultural hero and religious figure. There has been no single history of Jesus in America because there have been so many different ways to experience him secular as well as religious. So writes Professor Fox. So how do we find the real Jesus? We might just throw up our hands and say, it's all too confusing. It's all too contentious. Given the range of contradictory possibilities, who can ever say which one is correct? We can just give in to the temptation of nihilism, the sense that nothing really matters, that there, aren't any, there isn't any truth or meaning. There are many options. How could we ever decide which one is true, which is reliable, which is genuine? There are many ways to experience Jesus Many ways to express who Jesus is and what Jesus stands for. There isn't a single authority telling us what to believe. Everyone's understanding of Jesus seems to be shaped by cultural and economic forces. So how can any of them be true? Now, the alternative to nihilism is faith. Sure, we stand within our own perspectives and we bring our own culture, our own questions, our own concerns and preoccupations. We tend to see Jesus in our own image. But faith is the recognition that something happens when Jesus looks us in the eye, when Jesus comes at us, when Jesus confronts us with the possibility of transformation, then we aren't defining who Jesus is. Jesus is defining who we are. Faith is a basic orientation Toward life. Where do we put our trust? Upon what do we set our heart? Where do we find life? Where do we find light? What is it that feeds us spiritually and intellectually? We start out perhaps wanting some illumination concerning Jesus. But in the encounter, we are illuminated. The light is shined on us, and we are exposed for what we are, 
even when we would rather keep that hidden and secret. The encounter with Jesus for those disciples long ago and for us today, the encounter with Jesus is an experience of the world as a place of wonder. In this person, Jesus, God has come near to us. In him, heaven and earth meet. In him, we see as much of God as we will ever see. So there is more to Jesus than first meets the eye. As someone has put it, the New Testament shows us Jesus doing divine things in a human way and human things in a divine way. So that the two sides of the story remain always the story of one person. And if there's more to Jesus than meets the eye, there is also more to us than meets the eye. Speaking of the incarnation of Christ, an early theologian of the church wrote, he became what we are so that we might become what he is. In the encounter with Jesus, Humanity is transformed. The encounter changes what it means to be human. We discover the dignity of human persons. In a world that values some people and devalues others, we discover that all human beings are important, that all human beings have worth. Your life has inestimable value. And when you begin to doubt that, the consequences are frightening. While the encounter with Jesus brings affirmation, it also brings judgment. After Peter's confession that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, Jesus begins to show the disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the religious and civil authorities. Peter rebukes Jesus for saying that. This will never happen to you. Peter may have been thinking, this must never happen to us, your followers. But Jesus then rebukes Peter. Jesus sets him straight. He says, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. And then Jesus talked to the disciples about taking up their own crosses and following him. For those who want to save their life will lose it, says Jesus. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. So we return to the question with which we began. Who is Jesus? Perhaps we should be careful how we answer that question. What will our encounter with him mean for us? How do we discover what really matters, that in which we can genuinely place our trust? One of the great figures of the last century was Albert Schweitzer, who won a Nobel Peace Prize, who was a brilliant church organist, a medical doctor, and the founder of a hospital mission in Africa. Schweitzer was also an acclaimed biblical scholar. As a very young man, he undertook a rigorous academic study of the historical Jesus that was published in 1906. At the conclusion of an exhaustive scholarly study, 
he offers these lines about the subject of his inquiry, Jesus of Nazareth. Schweitzer wrote, He comes to us as one unknown, without a name, as of old by the lakeside. He came to those men and women who knew him not. He speaks to us the same word, follow thou me, and sets us to the tasks which he has to fulfill in our time. He commands, and to those who obey him, whether they be wise or simple, he will reveal himself in the toils, the conflicts, the sufferings which they shall pass through in his fellowship. And as an ineffable mystery, they shall learn in their, their own experience who he is. Amen. And thanks be to God who makes it so even for us.